So we're on 366, Parsis Basholach. It was an exciting Parsha. It's a uh, splitting of the Red Sea. Or actually the Reed Sea, but we'll talk about that. It begins by Yehi Basholach Paro Esa'am. And that when Pharaoh sent out the people, God did not take them by way of the land of the police team, because it's logical that he should have, because it was close by. Because God said that if I bring them through the land of the police team, even though it might be the easiest way to go, they'll be, the, the Jews will be attacked by the police team because they're invading their land. Um, and the Jews will say, hey, we're still, you know what? We're close enough to Egypt. We're going to go back. They say, we're not going out here. We're going to get killed. Better we'll go back. So he didn't send them that way so that they wouldn't have a immediate confrontation. Um, but there's a number of, uh, of you know, inconsistencies here. First thing, it says that Pharaoh sent the Jewish people out, and we know explicitly that he did everything he could not to send them out, and right? he didn't want to. Um, and, and the parsa, by beginning with the word vayihi, right, that it was, tells us, according to the commentaries, that there is an emotion involved here. That Pharaoh is, is saying, like, oi, the Jewish people have left. Like he's, right, in other words, that whenever you see this word vayihi, it says in the Medrash that it means to connote some type of exclamation of sadness. Uh, or desperation. So when it says that Pharaoh sent out the people, he's complaining, right, that he sent out the people, which is odd since, yeah, on the one hand, if you say he sent them out because, they, you know, God killed all the firstborn, so then um, you can say he sent them out, but he should want them out. So what is he complaining about? Second is, is that he didn't really send them out because purposely when Pharaoh says, I want you to go, Moshe said, okay, we'll go tomorrow. Like I said, you know, it was, we didn't say, like, okay, you know, open the door. We're going out right now. Moshe said, we're not leaving because you gave us permission. We're going to show you. We're going to stick around because you said it was time to go. We're leaving when God says it's time to go. We're leaving at the right time. You're not really the power here. That's what Moshe was saying to him. So it's a, the Medjus tells a story, and it says that, um, you know, a person... Uh, it, it tells a story about this person who had a relationship with the king and that he would always go and speak to the king but every time he'd go to the king the king would give him these terrible jobs to do these terrible like the king treated him poorly really really poorly like you know every time he'd come in the king would say you know go clean the washroom or go change the oil in my car whatever it is right? and this guy felt like he was a friend of the king's but every time he'd go the king would would always make difficult things for him um, and it says that, you know, finally he got fed up with it, and he, just, he told them he's not coming back, right? Because it was always this way. He realized when he didn't come back that he no longer had a relationship with the king. And he concluded that it is better to have a bad relationship than have no relationship when it comes to something like this. So uh, what the Medrash is telling us is that Pharaoh had a relationship with God, our God, the God. And it was a horrible relationship because he was fighting with them, right? And, and Pharaoh, of course, is losing, but Pharaoh's fighting with them. But Pharaoh felt it is better to have right, a, no, a bad relationship than no relationship. In, that, in other words, like, it's like you have a father and a son, and the father and the son fight a lot. But when it gets to the point where one of them feels there's nothing I can do to fix this, the fighting ends. They just stop, and there's no more relationship. It's over. Mm -hmm. and, there's, and now, in order to fix it, you've got a big chasm Right to go go past. You have to go past a big problem because you you put a finality to it. As long as Pharaoh saw, it, as long as God has a relationship with me, and he, even if He's punishing me, that means that there's a relationship. Right, that something positive could come out of this. Pharaoh could change. But as soon as God says, you know what, this Pharaoh, there's nothing I can do to change him. I'm just going to ignore him. I want nothing to do with him. It's like you know, if you have an employee and the employee does things you don't like. So you go to the employee and they said, look, you're a very good employee. You do your job terrific. But there's one area you got to fix. Right? And, and, and they don't fix it. After a while, you say, look, i got to let you go. I wish I didn't, but I have to. Why? Because you see that at a certain point, a person is saying, coming back to you and saying, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to fix this. I'm not going to change my relationship. I'm not going to do that. And then when, it, when the employer or the king or whoever we're dealing with comes to the conclusion that there's nothing I can do 
to help this person, they cut off their relationship with them. Right? So Afaro didn't, didn't necessarily consciously understand that as long as he has a relationship with God, I can always get better. God sees something in me that he wants to have this relationship with me. Because if God felt that no matter what he did, I would not get better, I would not change, I would not, do it, then he would have no relationship with me. And that's what happens now. As soon as the Jewish people leave, Pharaoh realizes that I have no more relationship with, that, with God. It's finished. Right? And so he yells, Oi. And what does he do? He goes running after the Jews. Because it makes no sense. He tells them to leave. Right? He tells them to leave. And they left. And now he's going after them. Like, if you didn't want them to leave, then don't tell them to leave. So why, why would he change his mind? You see, it, it, other times that he changed his mind, it said he didn't have free will. God changed his mind for him. God hardened his heart, it says. In this case, it doesn't say he hardened his heart. Pharaoh himself saw, get, you know, the Jewish people are gone. I'm not hearing from God anymore. There's no more punishments coming to me. All right, that means God's given up on me. I would rather have him not give up on me than, you know, than end up with... with um, and then have bad relationships. Yes. Um, where, where do you see that he's motivated by having a relationship with God rather than just the more uh, simple view of, you know, oh, now I don't have, no, I don't have anyone, you know, that can continue building for me, and I want power, and I want, you know, more buildings, and I. And well, I, we don't, other than the timing, mm -hmm. right? He's gone through all of this for so for so long, right? He's had this issue for so long that finally now that it, com it comes to him that he's, um, you know, he's lost this relationship, he's lost, he's lost them. So it's less than, less than a day. Like, they do, it, it says that, that they go out, and within a couple of, they get to the splitting of the sea six days after they leave Egypt, right? So we're talking about four days, three days, he comes to this conclusion. Um, it just seems that the logic is telling us that up until this point, Right, that he has the Hebrews working for him. He has a, this uh, this idea. Now that they're not working for him, the real impetus, the real change, was so that he has no more Jews. He has no more punishment from God because this has been going on for a long time. So our our, our rabbi seemed to think that it's got nothing to do with him actually wanting them back at this point. That it's more so that he's he, he's feeling the loss. Does he actually feel that he wants to have a relationship with God? Probably not. The rabbis are talking on a higher level right, than, than what he's conscious of. Because Pharaoh thinks he's God. He doesn't really need God, as far as he's concerned. But what he's, uh, so, but the rabbis are saying that on a deeper level, it is, uh, the message that the Torah is telling us, that Pharaoh is acting so illogically here, is that really, underneath it all, he wants to have that relationship. But, uh, but certainly we can explain it in many different ways. That's just how they want to try to see it. <clears throat> now, when it says that he didn't send them by way of the, the police team or the Philistines, Kikorovu, because it's close, right? So that has another meaning also. Kikorovu means for close it is. It is close, right? In other words, the cl what's the best way to send them? Send them through the land of the police team. It's the closest way to get to Israel. But he doesn't because the police team might attack. But they also say that the word korov is also has another meaning in Hebrew, which means a relative. You have a, a rel relatives are called kruvim, those who are close to you. Those are your relatives, your brothers, your sisters, your cousins, people who have a blood relation. Those are called kru kruvim, and those are people who, for instance, they can't give witness for you in court because they'll be tainted. They're going to always take your side because they're your family. Right? So that, that right? So here it says that. Why did God not take them by way of the, the Philistines? Because God considered the Jewish people like his family. In other words, he went beyond what would be normal. What would normally happen? He takes them out of Egypt, and you want to get them to Israel. So take them the fastest way. All right, so they'll have some trouble on the way. I'm God. They kind of make a big deal. I'll fix it. Right? The, the, the police team will attack them. I, I'll take care of it. They won't, they won't do anything to them. They won't win. And it's just us. Yeah, I'm, I can stop the police too, but what he can't stop is the reaction of the Jews. Right? They have free will. They're going to react. You know what? This is not worth it. 
Uh, I'm not going to go to Israel. We, as soon as we walk out, the first day we walk out, we got anti-Semitism already, people trying to kill us. We're going back. I'd rather I'll be a slave. At least, you know, I'm not going to have, have this go on. And, of course, they're already starting to fantasize about slavery that it wasn't as bad. You'll see a number of times they refer to it. But, but, but God is saying that these are my relatives. I'm going to treat them beyond what the norm might be. There's a specific expectation that I'm going to get them there. I, but my God says, no, I have to take into account also their psychological well-being, their emotional well-being, right, how they are and who they are, in order so that, that I should be able to get them to Israel, not necessarily in the fastest way, but in the best way. And sometimes this happens with us as well, where... You know, we're dealing with our children. There are expeditious ways of doing things, right? quick ways of doing things, but then there's also taking into account the personality and the feelings of the child. Right? That makes a difference. How about a, you know, a child who goes into the hospital? Right? The, uh, the example one of the rabbis gives today is uh, a child gets sick. God forbid a child gets sick and gets rushed into the hospital by an ambulance. Right? And they get into the the hospital. And the doctors grab the child and they're sticking them and doing okay. Why? Because they want to save the child's life. They're not interested in the fact that his child's scared or not scared. They're, they're interested that the child is alive, not dead. That's their job. But what's the mother's job? The mother who's standing there, she can't help him physically, you know, medically. She's a mother. She's not a doctor. So what does she do? She stands there and tries to make the baby feel better. She smiles at the baby and she rubs the baby and she does things to make the baby feel secure and to uh, right because the baby is also afraid, doesn't know what's going on. Why, even if it's a young child, not a baby, you know, who has some understanding, they still don't understand what's going on and why, and they're scared. So the mother tries to make them feel better because that's what a relative does. You care not just about the physical well-being, but also the emotional well-being of a person, because you're related. Um, and that's exactly what is happening here. God is saying, I'm taking into account how the Jews are going to react, that they may react scared. They're going to say, as soon as we just get out and already, like, uh, what is this? Like, what's going on with us? We just went through, like, all of these ten plagues and, and a slavery and a death and all of these things, and finally we should celebrate that we get out, and the day after we get out, we're at war again. It's just like what happened in the, in the state of Israel. You know, like, we have these Holocaust survivors get smuggled into the state of Israel, and they go to war immediately. Immediately, the state of Israel becomes a state, right? They have a war. And right, so now you go out of the Holocaust, you have enough time to eat something, and the war starts. You go through that war, and then you got the Sinai War. And then go through that war, you have the 67 War. And then after that, you have the 73 War. You got, these people are saying, like, you know, for God's sake already, give me a couple of months yeah, yeah. to make a family, to make a living, to do something. I'm, I'm going from being attacked as a Jew in Europe to being attacked as a Jew in Israel. Be attacked again, and attacked again, and attacked again. That, so God is say, what God is doing here is he's saying I'm, I'm going to be like the relative. Yeah, they're going to have some hard times, but I will be with them to make them feel better, to feel secure, to know that there's a future, to know that they're going to get through this. Exactly what a mother does or a father would do to a child. That's why it says that there. And that's why God did not take them to the Philistines. That tells you the answer. Why he didn't take them to the, Philist to the Philistines is not be just because they'd go to war and, and, and because of it they'd want to go back. It's because they would want to go back because of their feelings, right? God wanted to make sure that the feelings were there. And that's exactly what we saw earlier in Parsha Shmos. You know, Parsha Shmos, it tells us how there were these midwives, right? Pua and Shifra. It says their name was, that wasn't really their names. It was really Miriam and Yocheved. Miriam was Moshe's sister. Yocheved was Moshe's mother. They were midwives. That's what they did for a job. They did it for kindness, but they did it. And, it's, and it says there that why were they called Shifra and Pua if that wasn't their name? So it says Shifra was because she was the shopper. She would make the babies look pretty. Right? You know, a baby when they're first born doesn't look so good. Right? I mean, I don't have to tell you. You guys were there. I was not there. But they look pretty ugly. And they're all covered with gook. Right? So what did she do? As soon as the first chance that the mother could see the baby, Shifra would clean the baby and make them look nice and then give the mother the baby. And what would Pua do? Pua would make a sound that says, poo, poo, poo to the baby, make the baby smile so the mother would see the baby happy. Because remember, these, are, these women are slaves. 
they're having a horrible life and they're giving birth to a child who's going to be a slave so they wanted to, they said it's not enough that we're going to make sure that the child is born right that's what a doctor does that's what a midwife does but what makes them special was that they made sure that the mother and the child bonded they would clean the baby up and make the baby smile so that the mother and the baby should have a good relationship right away. That's what we're talking about here, the same idea. That God is saying, I am your Karov, I'm your relative, I'm here to, for that reason. That's it, I'm not here for any other purpose. And that's why it says that he did that. So then it says, um, right, that it goes on, Vyasa Velchimas Am Derech Midbar. So God took the Jewish people by way of the desert of Yam Suf. So Yam Suf, we usually translate it as the Red Sea. That's not what it really means. It probably was an error hundreds of years ago in a translation because it really should say Red Sea, not Red Sea. Um, Yam Suf means re, a, a sea of reeds. That is that there's like these reeds growing out of the water, right? Mm-hmm. So that's what the, what it's what it's really called. So you'll notice, like in, in Rabbi Hirsch's commentary in his translation, he doesn't call it the Red Sea; he calls it the Reed Sea. And you see that in a few of them, but often we always refer to it as the Red Sea. Is what we've always called it. But there's no word red here that gives you that under that reason. But then it tells us the next thing, which is the Chamushim Alu Bnei Yisrael Meiris Mitzrayim. It says with this word chamushim, the Jewish people came out of the land of Egypt. And everybody's wondering, what does this word chamushim mean? Chamushim could be 50, right? Chamishim, 50, because remember, there's no vowels in the Torah. It can, it can mean a fifth, one of five, right? Chamesh. It can mean many things. So Rashi gives us two answers. Rashi says that one is that they came up with, with, um, with chamushim, meaning they were one fifth. A 20 percent of the Jewish people came out of Egypt. The other eighty percent were killed during the plague of darkness because they were already too far gone and they could not become free people. They were their slave mentality was such that they couldn't get past it. So God said that that eighty percent weren't going to come, and they died during that plague. And twenty percent came out. Right, that's so. There says the Chamushim all over Israel. Twenty percent of the Jewish people came out. That, that's one understanding. Another one is Chamushim means weapons. That they came out armed. The Jewish people came out ready to battle if they had to. They not only took what they had to take, but they took out arms with them. Another commentary says that it that it means Chamushim is like a Chumash, a Torah. Right, this book is called the Chumash. It means five books. And it's referring to that, that the Jewish people came out with the merit of the Torah. That is, they didn't have the Torah yet. They came out with the merit of, of what they, good things that they did, which is acts of kindness. So what acts of kindness did they do that they carried out with them? Like, they were slaves. What did they do? We don't have any re- re- referral to anything happening here that the Jewish people as a whole did something like that. So I saw a commentary that explains all of this. It says that really all three of those reasons that I gave you, all of the different reasons for this word, or what the word means, are all accurate. But you have to put it together to understand. So he said, this is what happens as follows. There was a a need that a a significant uh, majority of the Jewish people had gotten to the point where they they were so badly damaged that they would not be able to continue on as being the, really, the kernel that created the Jewish nation. They just couldn't. They, they couldn't, for whatever reason. Their fault, not their fault. That's not the discussion for today. So, eighty percent of them. And it says that during the plague of darkness, when the Egyptians couldn't see and nobody could see, these people died from natural causes. At that point, eighty percent of them. Now, you can imagine if eighty percent of a nation died, right? So, they weren't all old people, right? They had to be young people as well, with families. Right now, certainly, if they died because they weren't the people who were ready or able to go out, chances are they weren't children who died. They were adults who died. Children aren't held accountable for what they do. They're children. So you have now lost 80% of the adults, but many of them have children, right? So the, 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 oh, and I left out one of the comments. One of the other comments was that everybody... All of the Jewish people, when they left, the Chumashim means that they all left with families of five children. Every one of the Jewish people who left, they had five children. That's what it says. So, now, 
now that 80% are dead, adults are dead, children are not dead. So what happened? So the Jewish people who were alive adopted the children from the families that were dead. They took them with them. They, they took those children. And so if 80% were dead, 20% were left behind. So that means that out of five, four are dead. So every one of those families, not literally, but so to speak, could have had a child, right? So that means that everyone who was remnant would have had, taken four children plus their own one child, they would have five. That doesn't mean literally five. It means that they adopted the children from the 80% so that they had the children of five families with them. Their family and four other families they took with them. This is what it means when it says that they took the mitzvahs, right, the, the merit of the acts of kindness that they did. This was the act of kindness because there is no greater act of kindness really than taking children who would not live Right? They wouldn't be able to live um, on their own. They would. They, right? I mean, what is a three-year-old going to do without parents? His parents died. So the the rest of the Jews took everybody in and they raised them as their own children. So that was the merit that they took with them was the good deed that they did to have these children come with them. So what we have now is the explanation as to how 80% died. Right? The children were adopted, so everyone went out with five children. It doesn't, when the Torah says it doesn't mean literally five children, it means the children, the five families. So each family went out with five families of children. Um, they went out uh, with those, the merit of doing all of that. Right? So the fact that they went out with um, the one who says Torah, the ones who says we weapons, right? Rashi says it was weapons. All of those could be true. They don't contradict. But we can now understand how it fits together. That when so many of them died, which is the first comment, then that so many of them left children, which now says they were adopted, that tells us the second and third comment, that they went out with five families of children, and they went out with the merit of adopting them. Now, anybody who has had the opportunity um, to adopt children knows that it's not easy. Not only is it you have to raise a child, which is not easy, but you have to raise a child who most, in many cases, are damaged. Right? There's, there's often a reason why a child, either they came from a family that there was something wrong with the parents, right? That's, that happens right today. That's, that's what you'll see. There's drug addiction or whatever. The children will come out. The children will have, could have learning disabilities, other types of problems that come from the genetics of their parents. Right? The, all of those things can happen. Certainly, we all can adopt children that aren't like that. They come from, you know, God forbid, somebody's got sick and died. Somebody couldn't afford to keep their kids. There's nothing wrong with them. But we can understand that it's not a small or simple undertaking to adopt a child. It takes a person with a big heart to adopt a child. And it really does, because you're, you're taking all of somebody else's problems and blessings, and you're raising them yourself. And it's wonderful to be able to do it. If you can, they did it. And that was the merit that they came out of Egypt with. That's what it means. So that's one of the ways that we can understand that that word, chamushim, that they came out with chamushim, means that they, they came out accomplishing all of those things. Rabbi, in the commentary here, it is according to the Midrash, the word derives from chamesh, a fifth. Mm -hmm. And it implies that only one fifth of the Jews left Egypt. Correct, 20%. Another, yeah. Right, that's exactly what I said. Yeah. Four, yeah. four out of five were killed. Mm -hmm. Right, so then by Yikach Moshe Esed, Samos Yosef Imo. The next line also is a bit odd. Here it says that as the Jewish people were leaving, Moshe took the bones of Yosef with him. Right now we know that Yosef asked asked the Jewish people. He actually asked them to take an oath that he should not be buried in Egypt, that he should go out of Egypt. So it says that they prepared his body and they waited till they left. So now, it was a long time later, so of course his body had decomposed, so he had his bones. So they, they placed it in, in some type of a casket, and, and they were going to take them. But who took them? Moshe himself took them, right? Moshe took that, them himself. Why? Because Yosef caused the Jewish people to take an oath. That God has promised you that you will go out from this land and my bones you will take with you. That's Yosef made the Jewish people promise. It says that, that, that Moshe took that with him. Now, 
this expression, the Yikach Moshe at Samas Yosef Ima, we find a similar expression later. It says that God told the Jewish people that they would leave Egypt with great wealth. Now, much of that wealth came from the Egyptians. That was in last week's Parsha. But it also says that after this, the, the Reed Sea split and closed, that all of the wealth that the soldiers from Egypt had with them was washed up on the side of the sea. Right, it says that, that the soldiers from Egypt were told, we're going to have a victorious day. I mean, you're, the, the greatest army in the world is going to attack these ex-slaves who are stuck, at, right? They're stuck at, at a body of water on three sides. We're going to come in on the fourth side. We're going to capture them or kill them, right? We're going to get the Jews back or we're going to kill them. Right, so they said, but wherever it is, we're going to be easily victorious. So Pharaoh told all of the men, decorate your chariots, decorate yourselves. Right, you're going to have a parade when you come back. You're, you're going to be famous. Right, so we want you to go out, you know, look good. So everyone took their best clothes, their best jewels, their best objects to decorate their chariots and their horses. Then they went out with it. When they were killed, it says that miraculously all of the wealth that they had with them was washed up onto the shore. Uh, the far shore where the Jewish people were and they gathered that in order to accomplish the wording that God said that you will leave Egypt with great wealth so they had that it says there the same expression by, by Yikach it says that they took all of these objects with them and here it says that Moshe took the bones of Yosef with them so the commentaries tell us that a, a chacham a wise person he knows like, what is important and what he sees as important is mitzvahs. That, that to other people it was jewels, to Moshe it was mitzvahs. And like, uh, the, there's a, a story that's told that is probably a medrash, uh, uh, but I, I never found it as a medrash. But it says the following story. It says there was this fellow uh, who had a family man who lived some, let's say, in some country, and he was really poor. He had nothing. And his family were starving. And he, he found out that there's an island in the South Pacific, let's say, and in this island, it's so wealthy that diamonds just lay in the sand. And if you go to this island and get the diamonds and you come back, right, you'll be a, well, a rich man. So he decides, that this is what I'm going to do. So his family gets together and they, and they decide they're going to save whatever little bit of money they make, they're going to save it so that he can buy a ticket to go on this boat to go to this island. Now it takes you know, like six months to get there, and the boat does not come back for six months, and then a, a boat comes back, right? So he's gone, right, literally for, for a, an entire, like, a year and a half. It's six months to get there, six months he's there, and six months he comes back. A year and a half he's gone, but when he comes back, the rest of their life is like Easy Street, right? They're going to have a pocket full of diamonds. That's all he's got to do is get off the boat, fill his pocket with diamonds, wait for the next boat to come, and off he goes. So it says he goes, and he gets in the boat, and he goes out there, and he lands on this island, and on this island, it's true, there's diamonds laying in the street. So he's picking up the diamonds, and he's putting them in his pocket, and he gets hungry. So he says, well, i got to eat, so no problem, I'm a multimillionaire. Goes into the city, and he goes into a restaurant, and he says, I, I like a meal. They say, sure, give him the meal. And they say, okay, you got to pay. And he pulls out a diamond. They say, what's that? It's garbage. They're all over the street. That's not money. You, have, you know what money is in our island? Money is animal fat. Because animals are rare in our island. And we need animal fat for cooking. We need it for taste. We need it for all kinds of things. So our currency is animal fat. You've got to go get animal fat. You want to live here. Right, until your boat comes. So you say, okay, what am I going to do? Right? So he's got a pocket full of diamonds that are not worth a penny in this island, at least. So he goes out and he starts working, and he gets enough money to get some animal fat, and he realizes how easy it is to make money here. So he's, he becomes like the king of animal fat on this island in a couple of months. He's got like enormous amount of animal fat, and he's like living like a king while he's waiting for the boat to come. And he's got like more animal fat than everyone. So now he, he, the boat's about to come. And he realizes, right, it's time to go back. So he says, all right, I'm going to take all of my animal fat. I'm going to take it with me. I'm going back, all right? This is worth real money. Right? You see, we, this is worth real money. So he takes all his animal fat, puts it in the hold of the ship, and off he goes for six months. But of course, by the time he gets back, the animal fat is spoiled. Right, and he gets off the boat, and he's and his wife and his kids are also excited to see him. He's been gone for a year and a half. They've been starving to death. Right, and they you know they they said okay you know 
you're back, you know, you must have the diamonds. And he says, forget the diamonds. I got animal fat. You wouldn't believe it. I, right? They're so much better than diamonds. And he, they take off the hold, and it all stinks, and it's terrible. And he realizes, what an idiot I am. Right? You need animal fat there, but here, diamonds are worth something. And he didn't bring any back with him, because he, he got so involved with the animal fat, which is now worthless. And he passes out. It says he wakes up in the hospital, and everybody's around him, and they're all happy. And they, what's what's going on? I just I ruined everything. I went, you know, we saved our money. You starved. It went a year and a half, and I come back, and I, I got nothing. You know, an idiot I am. And she says, "Well, yeah, it is true, but we went through your clothes, and we found one diamond, and that diamond is enough for us." that we can live for years off this and take care of you. You know, you, you'll have your medical bills, you'll be back to normal, and you'll live with that one diamond. So what is the story telling us? The story is telling us that, that we're living in this world. In this world, we have currency, you have money. You need money to live. you got to buy food. you got to do things, right? But the money is not going to help you in the next world, in the world to come. What's going to help you there is mitzvahs. They're going to help you there. Right? So a wise person understands this world is temporary. The next world is the real world. That's where we're going to be. This world is the island that you, we use animal fat for commerce. The next world, our animal fat is a waste. There's no, you, don't, you don't need animal fat. You don't need money in the next world. You need the currency of that world, which is the mitzvahs that you did in this world. Right? So most understands that. I'm, God says, hey, I'm going to leave great Egypt with great wealth. Yeah, I'm going to take Yosef's bones with me. That's a mitzvah. I'm fulfilling the command of, Moshe, of, of Yosef to take him out of Egypt. I'm taking his bones for burial in Israel. I'm doing a mitzvah. Everyone else is collecting money. That's fine. God told them. But when God said to me, I understand, you're going out with great wealth means I'm going out with mitzvahs. So the wise person takes mitzvahs. So that's the message that it's telling us that Moshe, as the leader, was letting the people know there's nothing wrong with being wealthy, having money. But don't get confused. Animal fat is animal fat. Diamonds are diamonds. They're two different things. But the real currency in the real world is mitzvahs. In the meantime, you're stuck on this island for 120 years. Makes sense. It's a fine. Take your money. But don't get confused. The real worth is in the mitzvahs, is in taking Yosef's bones with you, not the sapphires and gold that you find on the side of the sea. That's not the real worth. Right? He wasn't demeaning them, but he was letting them understand the true wealth. And that's what we need to understand. Right? We don't take a vow of poverty. We don't say it's bad, you know, that we don't have that uh, that you know, money is bad. We don't believe that money is evil. Not at all. If you don't have money, you can't do mitzvahs. You can't invite somebody to your house for Friday night dinner. You can't do a shake a lulav. You can't buy a lulav. You can't buy a matzah. You can't give tzedakah. You can't do anything if you have no money. Right? That's why the Talmud says a person who who is totally poor, like totally with nothing, is like a dead person. Because they can't give. They can't do anything. Right? A person feels dead. That's what they feel like. Because there's nothing they can do. Right? So we know that money is important. But don't get confused. Money is a vehicle. It's a vehicle. It's what we use to get mitzvahs. You have to eat. You have to have a house. You have to have your heat and your electricity. That's all true. you got to do all that. It's very important. But keep it, But remember that as we have all of this and we do all of this, those are vehicles to bring us to the end, which is the mitzvahs that we do. We don't acquire money for the sake of acquiring money. We acquire money for the sake of doing mitzvahs. And mitzvahs are supporting your family. Mitzvahs are having good, nice food on Shabbos. Mitzvah is inviting in the poor. Those are mitzvahs. But that's what we do and why we do it. Everything else is a vehicle to accomplish it. And that's the message that Moshe was saying by, by taking the bones of Yosef with us and the Torah giving such significance that a whole sentence about that. Okay, so then it talks about how they started to go. Alright, um, I'm just going to skip some of the stuff in here, but um, see, if you look here on uh, 14, on verse 5, it was told to the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants became transformed regarding the people. And they said, What is this that we have done that we have sent away Israel? 
right? So here is where he comes to the full realization of what's happened. Um, then he says he, he gets his chariots and he tells all the other guys to get the chariots and they go and they per, they go after the Jewish people, right? And it, and then it is and the Jewish people say to Moshe, look, I, I, here they are. You imagine they're standing at this. It, it's like a, an inlet, three sides water. And they're desert here. And they're looking behind them, and they see, right, they hear, and they see Egypt, this the army of Egypt coming at them. They have nowhere to go. So their response is, were there no graves in Egypt that you took us to die in the wilderness? What is that you have done to us to take us out of Egypt? Is this not the statement that we made to you in Egypt, saying, let us be and we'll serve Egypt? It's better that we should serve Egypt than we should die in the wilderness. That the Jewish people did exactly what God said was going to happen if he had taken them by the police team, and they still do it. And Moses says, no, God will help you. So, so let's get an idea of what happens now. The Egyptians are becoming close enough they can see them and hear them. And the Jewish people have nowhere to go. So it says that uh, here that, God, he, that Moshe prays to God. Um, that he, ha- Hashem says the, to Moshe, uh, God, Moshe prays to God. Then Hashem says in verse 15, back to Moshe, why do you cry to me? What are you doing praying? Stop praying. Do something. Right? That's what he's saying. Why do you cry out to me? Speak to the children of Israel and let them journey forth. You lift up your staff, stretch out your arm, and the sea will split. Right? That's what God tells him. In other words, Moshe, Moshe's got very powerful prayers, but there's a time for prayer and a time for action. So God's telling Moshe, I've already told you I'm going to save you. you are not, I'm not bringing you out into Egypt to drown in the sea. That, that makes no sense. Don't pray to me. Go act. Go to do. Right. So that's what he's he's saying. And, that, um, and God's saying, Don't, like it's time to do sports. So now, here's what what happens, and it says it in here, and some of it is done by um, uh, you know by Medrash, but it t- basically tells us that what happens next is that the Egyptians are getting closer, and the water is not splitting. Right? Moshe puts up a staff, and the water doesn't split. It doesn't happen. But Moshe tells them, God said, go into the water. Go. Nobody goes. Hey, wait, are we nuts? I, if you stay here, we're going to kill the Egyptians. We're going to the water, we're going to drown in the water. I, I, like, what are you telling us to do? So it says that there's one person whose name is Nachshon. Nachshon said, God says he's going to save us. God says we go into the water. We go into the water. And Nachshon says, jump into the water. And he kept walking into the water, and it didn't split. And he keeps walking into the water. It didn't split until he got his nose covered by water, the Midrash says. Not just his mouth, but his nose. In other words, he's going to die. He was he had no way to breathe. At the moment his nose was covered with water, God split the sea. From that point on, everybody went in. So the 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 Torah teaches us a very important lesson about this person, Nachshon. Because what did Nachshon do? It wasn't that Nachshon was was headstrong, or he was, you know, like, um, brave. He was faithful. He believed what God said. God said, I will save you. God said, go into the water. I'm going into the water. Everyone else said, this is nuts, right? I can see we're going to die. And he said, and Nelson says, God says, this is what we do. This is what we do. If God says Jews can breathe underwater, then we're going to breathe underwater. Whatever God says, we're doing it. Then he went in, and because he did that, his merit caused the water to split because he was was the one who showed the rest of the Jewish people that God keeps his word. Now, God keeps telling us this over and over and over. We've had this in the last three, four parshas. Every time God says something, he does it. And every time God says something, we don't believe him. Finally, we have an action where Nachshon shows, I believe, and he goes in and everyone benefits from it. The water now splits. And everyone goes in, and as it says, they, they go in on dry land. Right, he did not go on dry land. They went in on dry land. Um, in fact, you can see it when we get to this. Um, you can see it much clearer when we get to the psalm. But even here in verse 16, and you lift up your staff, stretch out your arm over the sea, and split it. The children of Israel shall come into the midst of the sea on dry land. Amen. And I, behold, I will strengthen the heart of Egypt. I'll come after you, and I'll be glorified through them. Glorified in that God is going to kill them all, all the Egyptians. How was Nachshon related to anyone? Who was he? Nachshon was a brother-in-law of, you know, a nephew of Moshe. And Moshe, uh, Nachshon's mother was um, Moshe's sister. 
Okay, he was Ben Aminadav. That was his father. Right. That's whose mother is that Miriam. Right. No, his mother was no. not Miriam. No, not Naxon's mother. Naxon's mother was Miriam. Oh, that's Moses' sister. His mother was Yechevin. Yes. And so they were sisters. No, Yochevin was Miriam's mother. Ah. Moses' okay. sister. Miriam is Moses' sister. Miriam, yeah. Okay. okay. So now it starts to tell us uh, what it, what happens. The angel of God, who'd been going in front of the camp of Israel, went in to, to the seabed, and and, and, uh, and uh, it split. He stood out of his hand. The sea moved. The children of Israel came into the sea on dry land. There was a wall for them on their right and on their left. Right? So that God made the water into a firm wall. Right, that's breaking the laws of nature. So Egypt pursued and came after them. Every horse of Pharaoh, his chariots, his horsemen in the midst of the sea. It happened in the morning. Hashem looked down at the camp of Egypt, and he confounded the camp of Egypt. Right, he made out that right. God went in and caused all the Egyptians they not to know what to do. Like they were all confused. They ran in after the Jews. He removed the wheels of their chariots, caused them to drive with difficulty. Right, and in they go. And basically, he then closes the water on them after the Jewish people have come out, right? And they see this, and, and there's a death. Now, as before this over, in the bottom of 375, we have the song that they sing. Let's understand what this is. First thing, the song begins with, Az Yashir Moshe in Israel. Thus sung Moshe and the Jewish people. But Az Yashir doesn't really mean that. The way I translated it, what it says here is, choose to sing this song. And I said it, thus they sung. All right, we know they sung past tense, but these words, as Yashir, is future tense. It's, yashir means to sing. They will sing. And the Jewish people will sing this song. But they did, they, that's not what it is. The Jewish people sang the song. Even when they wrote the, when it's in the Torah, which they get, uh, we read it next week that we get the Torah, it happened already. It should be in past tense. Moshe took. All right, Moshe took the bones of Yosef, past tense. Jewish people stood at the edge of the water, past tense. And then the Jewish people will sing. It's like something wrong. It's a, whoever wrote this book made a mistake, a grammar mistake. But it's, it's not a mistake. This, the Talmud says, is an allusion to to the, re the revival of the dead. One of the important aspects right, of Jewish faith is that we believe that in the future, everyone who has died will come back. Right, there will be a revival of the dead. People will will come back, and and that and that's a it's an important concept. It is one of the fundamental beliefs of Jewish life, right? And they get it from this because the Jewish people will come back and they will sing this song again. They will sing it when the Mashiach comes. So that's why they use it in in future tense, right here. That the Jewish people will sing that because what are they singing? This is. Can you imagine? They have no idea they're about to go into the sea and it's going to split and all that in advance. So they didn't compose a song, but yet it says that they all, right, like millions of people, sang this song together at one time. Right, um, and from this we understand this was a song of prophecy. This was there's a level of prophecy where I can say what God says, and there's another level of prophecy where a song comes out of me spiritually. It comes from me in a in a very high spiritual level, and everybody had the same vision. The same thing happened to them all at the same time. So they sang that song, and that's why that song is. And they quote it. And the song is full of all types of kabbalistic ideas and depth, and this is understood here. And the re now the idea is what it says. Why is it? that from here, of all of the places in the Torah, we, do we say we learn about the redemption of the dead? There could be other places we talk about it. We talk about, about Moshe took Yosef's bones, so he can go to Israel, and he'd be, would re, he would be re, re, right, recreated in the future. He would come back, reanimated. As we said, that's what we call the Tchias Amazin. Why do we say it here with this song? I understand the song is in future tense, but so God could have put it anywhere in the Torah. Right? So, the idea being is that um, is that the whole thing happens, this whole story happens because one person acted. Nakshon acted. He went into the water and he did something. Up until this point, it wasn't happening, right? God said, do this, he has to go in, then it's split. That's telling you, we want to have Tchias Amesim. Right. Tchias Amesim is, is a miracle that we will not, we won't see it until it happens. In other words, we have to believe in it. Because I can't prove it to you. I can't tell you what happened once before. It didn't. 
it's a it's total faith, it's belief. What it was what did Nakshon do? Nakshon did an act that was total faith. He put himself in a situation where if God didn't split the water, he would be dead. Not like the Jews who were standing on the water, and they might die if the Egyptians catch them, yes or no. But he would be dead. He walked into the water till it covered his nose, so he couldn't breathe. There was no way to breathe. He was going to die. He, he actualized his belief. That's what he did. I acted on my belief that God will save us. And because of that, God saved us. Right? That's the idea of Trias Amazing. With Trias Amazing, we have to understand that there is no way we can prove it. But it is so integral to our belief that just like here, we see somebody acted on belief and because of it, the sea split. So too, our belief in the Chiyas Amesi, right, is integral to it happening, to it actually happening. It's one of the Rabbam's fundamental beliefs of Judaism. In other words, if you don't believe in Chiyas Amesi, if you've studied it and you understand and you you reject it, you are not a following Judaism correctly. It's that fundamental. It's like if you told me that there's more than one God, but I'm Jewish. Then there isn't. There's one God. And the belief and, and the foundation of our religion is that there's only one God. That's it. So if you say, well, I believe in everything in Judaism, but I think there's five gods. Well, sorry, you don't believe in Judaism. Right? Same thing with T.S. Mason. If you don't, then you're missing something in your faith. And his action showed us and it's telling us the same thing here. We need to act with total faith in order for Tchiyas Amesim to happen. It is the perfect place for us to learn this because he did just that. That's what he did. That's what we have to do. That's the idea behind it of why Tchiyas Amesim is learned here in this section. Now, there are many, many details in here that talks about um, you know, some, you know, some real depth in here. For instance... Um, If you look like on verse 5, on 377, it says, Deep waters covered them. They descended in the depths like stone. Now, in other words, the Egyptians, right? They went into the water. It was dry. God put the water back on them. And the deep water covered them, and they went to the bottom like stone. Right? That's what it says. Now, there's a, another place. Um, it says that that when God, when, when, when they were drowning... Um, that they were like straw. I, uh, um, I'd have to read through to exactly find the sentence, but it's in here that they, part of the song says that they went like a stone, another part of the song says that they were like straw. What does straw do? Well, straw is you go up and down and up and down and up and down, right? And know, a, a person's drowning, right? So they're drowning, right? So they go under the water. And they come up and they get a breath and they go back down again, right? You know, you don't just fall go down to the bottom, right? But if you did just go down to the bottom, you'd die right away, and a much less pain than if you're going up and getting a little bit of air and down and up and down. You're, it's like you're starting over. It's like torture. Every time you go up, you get a little bit of breath, a little bit of water. You go back down. You, it fills your lungs again. You try to go up again. You don't get up. You have to, to try again. You get up this time. You don't get up five more times, and finally it kills you. Now, you can be drowning for hours that way, while the other person drowns and dies in a matter of moments. If I've already told you that everybody in the water is going to die, which would you rather do? Would you rather be going up and down and up and down, or would you just want to just die? If you're thinking of yourself, you'd rather just die. If I'm telling you, you're going to die. It's a dumb deal. Anybody in the water is going to die. Which is it would you rather do? Go through an hour, two hours of torture or die in eight minutes? Right? That's really the question. So the, the, the story is telling us is that the Medrash says that the righteous, the more righteous Egyptians, the ones who were less of a problem, died like a stone. They died right away. Those who were the antagonists, the real difficult ones, they did. They died like the straw, up and down and up and down and up and down. Part of the song was that the Jewish people saw the justice of God. Right? Because God was revealed to them when they saw this happen. It was like they saw God. <laughs> the water split, the water closes, you know, finally, one time in the world, you can say justice is clearly served. The Jews are saved. The evil people who are trying to kill them are killed right in front of their eyes. That does not happen very often in this world, where the person who was, right, the person who was the victim is saved, and the person who was the aggressor is killed right in front of their eyes, right? It doesn't, you just don't see it. People get away with it all the time, things happen, 
right? That's how the world is. Mm-hmm. So if that's the case, then right, here they actually see it. They actually see that they. So when it says they saw God, they don't see God. There's nothing to see. There's no body. God can't be seen. They saw God's attributes so clearly as like a human being standing in front of them doing this. They're like a guy sees somebody beating up a woman, and he gives, goes over there and he beats up the guy. You know, how can you do such a thing? But that's what, what they saw. And that showed the amazing justice. That's just one of many, many examples of the depth of what we find within the words of these. Um, see, if it, look at 379, verse 7. It says, you send forth your wrath and consumes them like straw. All right, that's what I was just telling you. So how come God didn't wipe out the whole of Egypt after everything that had happened to them in Egypt? He wanted... Um, we have to understand the whole picture. The whole, what was the whole purpose of all of this? Why didn't God just, like, you know, one day we're slaves, the next day we're not? Like, why does he go through this whole rigmarole of, you know, ten plagues? And, like, I could have just made, made Pharaoh just give in, right? Why didn't he? What's the whole story, the whole purpose? So he says it here. He says, when he says that the, the Egyptians are going to be killed, he says, and my name will be glorified by this. God certainly does not want to create people so that he can torture them. That's not the idea, right? He didn't bring Egyptians in the world so he should kill them. That doesn't. That's no glory, right? You know, I, I'm tougher than them, so I'm going to be glorified. This is God talking. Right? It's got to be just. What God was saying is that for once and for all, you want to know: is there a God? You want to know? I'm going to show you. I'm here. I'm going to send these plagues on these Egyptians. I'm going to tell the Egyptians in advance: this is what I'm going to do if you don't listen to me. I'm real. But I'm real. You don't want to. You, you don't see me. You don't believe me. That's fine. I'll turn all your water into blood. You, know, you don't believe me? Okay. I'll kill all your animals. You no. Know? I'll kill your firstborn. All right. I'm going to show you I'm real. Not just for them. For everyone forever. Ever throughout history. From now on, God revealed Himself. You know, someone say, you know, I believe in God. If He just makes this this cell phone go up in the air a couple inches. Just that's all I ask of him. Do that and the rest of my life I'll follow him. Besides the fact that you won't, he won't either. Why won't God do that? Because he did it already. That's what this is. He did it. Right? Am I really so arrogant to think he's got to do it for me too? He did it for the Jewish people. Right? We have a, we have a book that tells us this. We have you know other types of things that corrobor- collaborate this. We basically know God did that. And the reason he does all of this is so we should have that knowledge. So that's why he does what he does. He's doing all of this now, and he's never going to do it again. It's not going to happen again. He is not going to prove to you that he exists, because he did already. Just go back and look in history, and you will see it happen. That's what he's saying to us here. So as this is going through, and we're coming up with all these details, they're all very important and nice. But the bottom line is, and is that God is proving it. That's why, if you look, well, like we have so many mitzvahs. They keep saying, remembering going out of Egypt. I put on tefillin to remember the going out of Egypt. I say Kiddush on Friday night to remember the going out of Egypt. I have a Passover seder to remember the going out of Egypt. I wear tzitzis to remember the going out of Egypt. Like, how far do you go? Okay, I remember already. Like, the guy says, no. That's not the idea. It's not you remember, you remember, you go by milk, you know what it tells you? This is the foundation of your life. I'm real. I'm real. I'm telling you, I'm real. I came to your forefathers. I did this for them. They saw me. They saw what happened. They told you what happened. So now you know it. Don't come back to me and say, I believe in you if you did this. I already did it. Now believe in me. Now now it's real. So that's all of this. That's really what it's all doing, is it's showing us for the rest of history that we're real. Right? That's why, for instance, you know, it's very hard to prove a religion. Because by definition, if you can't prove God, really, you can logically extrapolate God, but you can't really prove it. I can't show it to you. I can't say, okay, come here tomorrow at 10 o'clock and he'll be here. I can't do that. Right? So the whole idea uh, is what we do is that we have this Torah. It proves something different. What the Torah does is, is that it shows us that Judaism is the only religion in the history of the world that had the entire nation present when God revealed himself. Like if you study any religion, they'll all tell you that this one fellow who, ha- who is the leader of the religion or the prophet of the religion, he had an interaction with God. And then he came and told us, 
It could be Jesus. It could be any, any of these people. They had an interaction with God, right? Shiva with the Hindus. They had one-to-one reaction with God, interaction with God. And then he comes and tells us. Of course, he tells us I'm special because I'm the one who had it. You've got to listen to me. I'm in charge. But, he, but it, let's say that he really believes it. And he had this interaction. We're the only religion that says that you were there. Everybody was there. Every Jew who was alive was literally there. And our understanding is that the soul of every Jew was also present. But certainly every Jew that was alive, if you deserved to see it, you didn't deserve to see it, if you were an old woman, a young woman, a young man, a baby, you were there. You saw this happen. You experienced this. Our religion is the only one that can say that three million people were there when God and man touched. Everyone, every other religion was... You have to believe me. I, I saw this happen to me. I, I was there. I was dying in the middle of the desert, and God came and talked to me and gave me this book. And I'm now giving you this book of how to live our lives. Right? And God, in this book, it says that I'm in charge. Right? Uh, our, what does our book say? That Moshe messed up, messed up again, messed up again. Right? You think Moshe would write that, a book like that? So th- these are all proofs, right? logical proofs that, that, that our religion is real. And that's really the foundation of what we're, we're, we're saying here is that it's real. Now, this is everything that we've done so far is for that purpose. And it'll culminate next week with the reading of the Torah where we actually receive the Torah because that is what all of this was about. You see, if you remember the first Rashi in the Torah, the first Rashi in the Torah is where it talks about Right, you know, Bereshi, Spara, Elohim, God created the heavens and the earth. So Rashi says, like, what is all this? What do we need this for? What's the the Torah is a book to tell you how to live your life. So what do I need to know about who, how he created the world and how he did this and he had water first and then he did that and then he did this and he did that and then he made Abraham and then Abraham had a baby and the baby went here and Ishmael went there and Isaac went here and this. Who cares? There's a book of, to tell me how to live my life. It's a direction. Right? You, like, you buy a toaster and it tells you in there the whole history of the company? No, it tells you how to operate the toaster. So I'm living. I want a book. Tell me how, how does God want me to live my life? Well, I don't care about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we're actually asked that question. Well, why? Why, why? Why do we have so much that tells us it's not, it's not a law book? Right? There's more to it. So what Rashi says is because the world will come to you one day and they'll say, you're a bunch of thieves, you Jews. You stole the land of Israel. The Canaanites lived in the land of Israel before you, and you went in there and you killed them all and threw them out, and you took over. You're thieves. They're there. It's their land. And this is the land of Canaan, not the Israel. This is Canaan. And we say, no, God created the world. And God gave the world to whoever he wants. And he says in the book he gave us that he gave us this piece of land. This is ours. God can give it to the Canaanites and take it away. It's his land. He can do what he wants. And yeah, that that's a proof, right? In other words, if the Torah is true, and all of these stories are in here, and it keeps talking about how he's giving the land of Israel to us, so then it's for it's ours, right? That's why it's there. It's the same thing. Is why does he do this? Why does he do all these plagues on Egypt? Right? To split the Red Sea, kill all these Egyptians, give us all this wealth, take us out, give us the Torah, because he's proving to everybody in the world that he's real. This is the real deal. When I tell you. They keep Shabbos because it's good for you? It's that, oh, maybe it is, man. It is. I'm telling you. I'm real. I'm here. You just have to come to me and you'll see I'm real. So God said, okay, it's so hard for you. Because I know I created you physical. You can't see me. You can't hear me. Nothing. So I'm going to give you one chance that you're going to hear me and you're going to experience me and you're going to see things happen that were not possible. Not possible for water to stand up. I'm going to show you water stand up. It's not possible that every single house, the firstborn son should die. Not the firstborn daughter, not the secondborn son, not no son. The firstborn son should die at the same moment in every single house in this country and only those people and nobody else in the world. Right? Only this, we're going to make the whole world, this, this whole country dark, but for the Jews it won't be dark. At the same time, for the, for the Egyptians, the water will turn to blood, but for the Jews, the water will be water. At the same time, and if an Egyptian wants water, he has to go buy it from a Jew. But that's I, how more plain can he be? Right? I understand it's a long time ago, and we don't have all the you know we have we have this idea in our head that it's so long ago, uh, it's all messed up that the, that it didn't work, it didn't come out right, but people aren't following it. The fact is, we can answer all of those questions. The bottom line, really, we can. It's not all that long ago.